Welcome for the second lecture of the course Optimization Methods for Machine Learning and Engineering. Today's lecture is on the Newton method, loss functions and regularization. So the topic for today is first we will see a repetition of some basic concepts of linear algebra that you will need in the course going forward. We will look at Newton's method in detail, which will result in great speed improvement compared to gradient descent, which we had seen last time. And then we will go further into uh, model fitting as optimization, this perspective on machine learning with a couple more applications and, uh, for example, also how to fit probability distributions in an, in an uncertain environment. So first of all, let's have a look at linear algebra. And uh, these are basic concepts that you should recall from, from your prior uh, study. So linear algebra one, probably you all had that during your bachelor. Um, and uh, now let's have a look at some of the, of the notation that will be used and also how to implement linear algebra concepts in a computer program. And uh, there we will use a particular programming language that uh, is, is commonly used today in machine learning environments. The programming language is called Julia. Don't fear another programming language. It uh, will be quite basic what we are seeing today, um, but uh, it's quite suited and it provides us with the, um, with the syntax that we need uh, to do linear algebra without having uh, to, uh, to call into uh, dedicated libraries or uh, do other complicated things. So linear algebra will be built into the programming language and it's all a lot easier than it might sound right now. So first of all, how I want to motivate the section on linear algebra is by the Fibonacci series. Might sound strange, but hopefully everything will be resolved in the end. So the Fibonacci series is a recursive rule that defines a sequence of numbers. And the sequence is 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34. And uh, the idea behind that is that uh, you always sum up the two preceding numbers. So to get to the two, you sum up one and one. To get to the three, you sum up two and one and so on. So you, you take the sum of the two preceding entries in the series. And uh, this is a quite famous sequence or series. It was first published in the Western world in 1202 in a book called Liber Abaki. And uh, this book uh, was uh, authored by Leonardo da Pisa. Later uh, he was known under the name Fibonacci. And uh, this book is famous for introducing the Hindu Arabic numeral systems so that we have numbers 0 to 9 and then uh, and that's the difference from the Roman numbers that existed before. So this book originally introduced the Hindu Arabic numeral system in the Western world and also introduced the, the Fibonacci series and here you see the, the, the original text and the first original mention of the Fibonacci series. Um, this is also a pattern that occurs in nature, so you can see that in certain types of plants, uh, how the seeds are arranged in a flower, uh, but you can also see this, for example, in a family tree, where if you go back a certain number of steps uh, in your family tree, the number of male ancestors will be uh, from the Fibonacci series. In computer science, it's also important, so there are algorithms that uh, can be described or their runtime can be described by the Fibonacci series. Uh, so it's, it's quite versatile. And uh, if we go back even before Liber Abaki, the, the series has been uh, looked at and studied in Sanskrit poetry. So on the Indian subcontinent, uh, even 450 before Christ. Okay, how can we compute the Fibonacci series. Uh, what you see here on the right hand side, this is a piece of Julia code where we define a function, uh, fib of k, and uh, if k is smaller than 2, we return 1, 
Uh, so this is at the very beginning of the Fibonacci series and otherwise we recurse and we take the two or we compute the two preceding entries in the Fibonacci series and return that. Uh, the problem here is that the runtime of this little algorithm is exponential because when we increase k by 1 we effectively double the or nearly double the amount of computation that has to be done and uh, doubling the runtime or nearly doubling it with every k this is exactly uh, the exponential runtime where um, um, soon runtime will, will, will really explode so you see that for the initial elements of the series we can compute that in, in, in micro to milliseconds uh, for 49 entries or the 49th entry we need uh, 27 seconds and then going back one more step one additional entry we're up to 44 seconds so well about double uh, of course there are other uh, influences uh, in your computer what your operating system is scheduling and so on so it's not exactly double here but you, you get the idea. So if we were to increase this further, soon we would run into computational limits even on the fastest computers. How can we improve this? The first technique that we will see is a memoization, where we do not recompute a result that we already know. So if we already know the 49th and the 48th entry, why would we have to recompute everything to calculate entry 50? So actually the runtime should be linear. And this is exactly done here. What you see in the code is that uh, we generate an array or, or a vector with, the, um, with enough space uh, to store the uh, Fibonacci entries in the, in the series before. So here we have the, oops, we have here the first entry one then one then two then three and um, by stepping through the list that way we have a linear runtime in the number of elements so this is quite uh, straightforward what you're seeing here so the runtime is now linear and uh, if we want to um, uh, go from 1000 elements to 10,000 elements we have an about by 10 computation time how can we get even faster? And uh, we can get a lot faster than linear. And for this, we will now invoke or recapitulate some of the basic concepts of linear algebra that you all have probably heard, but we will refresh this uh, just to, to, to have them in memory again and to also see how the syntax in the Julia language compares to that. What you see uh, on the top part of the slide this is just the mathematical notation for a vector column, uh, for a column vector. So the, the column vector is basically just um, a set of, of numbers arranged in a column. And in, um, in uh, Julia, we can express that quite easily. We say v equals 1, 2, 3, put that all into square brackets, and we put the semicolon. You can also use a comma, or uh, here we use the semicolon in between them to indicate that these are all the, the entries of, of the vector that we are creating here. And uh, Julia will return this element to us and also indicate some, some type information. And here the type is that it's an int64 array of one dimension. Okay. And we can turn this column vector in a, into a row vector by taking the transpose. So this um, symbol that you see here, this is the symbol for, for taking the transpose. And uh, so instead of arranging it in a row, uh, a column, we now arrange it in a row. And uh, in, in Julia, the syntax is, uh, is quite similar, but now we only use a space between the elements. And that gives the indication that here we want to have a row vector. Um, one, one difference here is, Julia now returns to us an array of dimension 2. So actually what Julia does behind the scenes is when you give him a row vector, it will make it a matrix. And here it will be a 1 by 3 matrix. So 1 rows and 3 elements in that row. And uh, we can also 
directly in Julia, take the transpose. So here this, um, this prime symbol is used for that. So V prime is exactly the transpose of the, of the column vector that we had initially. When we have a column vector and a row vector, we can multiply them. And uh, the idea is that if you take a row vector and multiply it with a column vector, then there is an element-wise multiplication and addition. So here, the first element of the row vector and the first element of the column vector, these are multiplied. And then this is repeated for the second elements and uh, the respective results are, are added together. So this is just a, um, um, a convention uh, for how uh, row and column vectors are multiplied. This doesn't work if we want to if we if we switch the uh, the order of the row and the column vectors. So this is just uh, the the convention how how it is to be done. Later in a later lecture we will see more of uh, the definitions from, from vector spaces, which are a generalization of this concept, then everything will make, um, will, be, will be more grounded in, uh, in a formal mathematical sense. Um, but for now, this is, this is the rule and uh, you can just apply the rule. We can do this as well in, in Julia. So here V transpose times V is exactly a row vector times a column vector. And, um, this is 14 and you can just check that result for yourself. And um, so on the next slides also we will see um, the Julia code and the results so that you can also debug your thinking and you can follow the code and see if your understanding of the mathematical expression uh, matches to, to the given results. One important thing in this course, unless otherwise stated, all vectors will be row vectors. And uh, the, the vectors will always be printed in a fat font, so or in a bold font. And uh, by that, uh, you can uh, get some metadata on the formula to see that, okay, here it's a vector, or here it's a row vector that is multiplied with something else. And uh, what well, the convention is, uh, bold, lowercase symbols will always indicate vectors, and they will be column vectors if not stated otherwise. Okay, going forward, we will see matrix vector multiplication. So I assume you all know what a matrix is. So it's uh, basically a grid of, uh, of numbers and um, more really mathematical details follow then later for the vector spaces. But for now, it's just a, a grid of numbers. And uh, what we can do is multiply a matrix with a column vector. And uh, what we essentially do is we turn the matrix into um, row vectors and then multiply each of the row vectors with the column vector. And uh, this will then result in one entry of the resulting column vector. So if I take a matrix and a column vector and I multiply the two, I will get a column vector out. Yeah, so here I'm taking the first element and uh, this vector, and this gives me the first, the first entry of, of this resulting column vector. The Julia code is uh, what you probably have expected. So um, the notation for the matrix is that we use um, spaces to indicate the rows, and uh, then a semicolon, and uh, maybe also a new line, but the new line is not required to uh, indicate that we're now moving over to, to the next row and the v is a column vector as, as, as before. And we can just multiply the two, so a star v here is the, the, the syntax for multiplication. Okay, we can also multiply a row vector and a matrix. And again here, the order is different. So if you have a row vector, you have to put it in front of the matrix for the multiplication. And here, we think about the matrix as being consisting of column vectors. And now we can take the row vector and multiply it with each of the column vectors and get uh, the, the matching result in the output row vector. So in this case, the output will be a, a row vector. In Julia, it's, uh, the matrix that you see here is the same, but um, uh, now we take a, uh, a vector that we transpose 
to have a row vector and multiply that with a and we get out this result here and you can just follow along uh, to, 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 to see whether your understanding of the mathematical formula leads to, to the same result. We've seen matrix and vector multiplication, but we can also multiply two matrices. And the idea behind that is that we split the, 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 the left-hand matrix into row vectors and the right-hand matrix into column vectors and then uh, we, we mix and match and um, uh, take the first row vector and the first column vector and this gives us the first entry in the result matrix and um, then we can take the, uh, the first row vector which indicates also the row in the result matrix with the second column vector and uh, get this output and uh, here uh, the, the result will be a matrix and uh, the, the dimension of the result matrix is obviously determined by the dimension of the input matrices. And uh, for the input matrices, uh, they need to match up. So if I have uh, as, uh, on the, on the left-hand side an n times k matrix, then on the right-hand side I need to have a k times n matrix so that the k is matching up. The algorithmic runtime of this is n times k times m then, so it's, it's getting quite expensive over time. Um, what uh, is important here, or which might come up from time to time, is that if I take the, the transpose of a times b, and uh, then I can um, remove the, the brackets, but then I have to also switch the order then I have to multiply B transpose times A transpose. So a matrix can be transposed just as a vector, just by flipping it over. And um, why this has to be done becomes quite clear when we are looking at um, the dimensions. So here then I would have an M times K matrix times a K times N matrix, so that again the, the K dimension is, is matching up as it did before. Um, Okay, there are additional algebraic rules for matrix multiplication. So first of all, uh, matrix multiplication is associative. It is not important how I put in, in the brackets. This will not change the result. You see this here with an example, but this holds uh, in, in general. And uh, second, matrix multiplication is not commutative. So in general, you cannot switch the order of two matrices that you will multiply. And again, here you see an example where this is the case. There are some examples where you can commute, but these are rather special cases. Why do we care? Why have we now spent so much time on linear algebra when all we wanted to do is compute the Fibonacci series fast? And uh, for this, let me show you how computing the Fibonacci steps can be turned into a matrix vector multiplication. So the first two elements of the Fibonacci series, these were one and one. And here we have a, a column vector that exactly contains the first entries one and one. And um, what we now do is, uh, we always consider two elements of the Fibonacci series, like a small window of the Fibonacci series, and then we slide that window one over. And when we slide that window one over, we want to sum up the preceding elements and only take the second element of the preceding little window. So if the window was here, um, one, two, three, four, uh, five, this is the first part of the Fibonacci series. And then, um, oops, now we also have here one more one at the beginning. And then uh, our window is initially this part, and then we slide over the window, and then we get to this part. Um, and uh, sliding over the window is exactly a matrix vector multiplication. So we have the matrix here, and when we do the multiplication, we have the first entry time plus one time the second entry. And then here down below, we have one time the first entry 
of the of the column vector and then we get out to one uh, so here we had one one now we have two one uh, and we can repeat that we can always take um, the the current element that we have the current window of the Fibonacci series um, multiply that with a matrix and uh, move the window one over so um, we repeat that and the next entry would be 3, 2, and uh, this, this is exactly what, what we are expecting. And now we can do that many times. Uh, and now here we have uh, repeated the matrix multiplication two times, and uh, we can just take the power series of this matrix. So we take the matrix here to the power of k, multiply that with the first two entries, and that gives us then a certain window later on in the Fibonacci series. And uh, the basic trick at this time is that uh, taking the power series can be done a lot faster because assume that we wanted to take the eighth power, then we only have to uh, square the matrix three times. So the power of two times the power of two times the power of two gives us the eighth power. And now by this is different when, uh, for example, it would be to the seventh power, but uh, with th some tricks we get down to approximately log k steps for taking the, the k's power of, of this matrix. So now we no longer have a linear runtime, now we have a logarithmic runtime. And this gives us great efficiency improvements. Uh, what we do here is, um, we, this is all written in Julia, um, the code should be more or less self-explanatory. So here we take the, the power of the matrix and uh, multiply it then with uh, the row vector and return the first element of the resulting vector. And um, the computation time is now a lot faster. So before uh, computing the thousandth Fibonacci number, we can have a look how much time that did take. Okay, we have to go back quite a lot. Uh, the thousandth element took uh, mm, something seven, and now we are at something something two. Uh, and uh, but the idea is that you now going forward and taking the millionth Fibonacci element and so on, this will be computed a lot faster than just by taking the the linear algorithm. But can we? Can we be even better? Now we have had logarithmic runtime and in computer science usually when it's logarithmic we are already really happy. But can we do even better than that? And actually we can. We have seen that we can take the kth power of a matrix. But can this k actually be negative? And yes it can be. And this gives us a new concept which is the inverse of a certain matrix. So not all matrices have an inverse. We will see in another lecture uh, details on that. Uh, but many matrices do have an inverse. And uh, the idea behind that is if I multiply a matrix with its inverse, then I get the identity matrix, which only has diagonal entries. And the diagonal entries are all one. And all other entries are zero. So this is the definition of the uh, diagonal matrix. So here we have the uh, one vector and take the diagonal matrix of that and this is the identity matrix and if you see an expression like this uh, with a, with a bold font one or, or this I matrix here then this indicates um, uh, a matrix of the appropriate dimension. So in some cases we do not state explicitly the size or the dimension of vectors and matrices uh, because these are things that occur oftentimes and we just assume that from context it is clear that how long this, this one vector, for example, has to be uh, in order to result in the identity matrix that has the same time, the same size as A times uh, uh, the inverse of A. Um, in order to make this happen, the matrix A has to be square. So this is something that is an absolute requirement uh, for the existence of, of an inverse. So the identity matrix, it does 
nothing actually. So if we if we multiply a matrix uh, with its identity with an identity matrix, then we will just get the same result back. So a times identity is a. And uh, the inverse is actually something that does commute. So a does commute with its inverse because the result in both cases will be the identity. There are some uh, computational tricks to compute the inverse fast, but the, the fastest, fastest methods that we have available still have a runtime of um, n to the power of two point something. And uh, for large matrices, this will become prohibitive. So uh, we can compute the inverse, but when the matrices are really big, we have 10,000, 100,000 um, entries in every dimension. Um, then computing the inverse is just no, no longer really feasible. And uh, also when we get to big optimization problems, uh, this, this can become an issue. In Julia, the notation is quite easy. So having a matrix, the inverse is just inf of a. And uh, if we multiply that with a, we get back the, exact, the expected result. So this is just the identity matrix with ones on the, uh, on the diagonal. Now we come to the, uh, to the slide that finalizes the section on the Fibonacci series where we'll see how we can compute Fibonacci in constant runtime. So, and uh, this requires some more linear algebra trickery, uh, but fear not, it will all be hopefully uh, self-explanatory. Um, if a matrix A is symmetric, um, so this is a sufficient condition, but it's not necessary, so there are also non-symmetric matrices where this is the case. Uh, but when a matrix A is symmetric, then it can be factorized by a so-called eigen decomposition, and uh, we get out two matrices uh, C and big lambda, uh, for which we have A is C times big lambda times uh, the inverse of C. And um, you, um, let's take our matrix A that we have used for the Fibonacci series. In there, the eigencomposition results in these two matrices, C and uh, big lambda. And the importance of big lambda here is that uh, it only has diagonal entries. So here we find again this uh, notation for the diagonal entries only. And, uh, you don't have to understand where the eigen decomposition is coming from, so, but this is the only part that is, uh, is surprising on this slide. You just assume that uh, for this matrix there is this eigen decomposition and it can be found. And when we have the eigen decomposition, we can um, increase the speed even further uh, because if we take the kth power of A, uh, we take the kth power of the eigen decomposition. But now what we do is we are multiplying C with its inverse. So here, this part is the identity. It does nothing, so we can just scratch that one out. And uh, so in the beginning, we have the matrix C. Then we have the matrix uh, big lambda. And this matrix big lambda, it is repeating k times. And then we get C inverse. But we know that big lambda has only entries on the diagonal and otherwise it's zero. And when we take the power of a matrix that only has entries on the diagonal, then it is a lot easier because then we can just uh, element-wise uh, take the power. So we then have a matrix where we have one plus square root of five divided by two here is a zero, here is a zero, and then one minus the square root of five divided by two. And now we can just take the power of each diagonal element individually. And how, how this goes, you can uh, visualize it quite easily when, when you are multiplying this matrix with only diagonal en entries. And this can be really fast. So what we now see is the, the coup de grâce. Uh, so the Fibonacci as a closed form expression, which will be the high point and also the end of uh, this uh, last section 
on linear algebra, we can actually compute the Fibonacci series in constant time, or the, some element of the Fibonacci series in constant time. And uh, for this, we need some trick, uh, some trick that uh, you that might be surprising to you, uh, that you don't have to fully understand. But there is only one trick, and from that on, it will all follow with the usual linear algebra concepts that we have already seen. The trick here is the so-called eigendecomposition. And uh, if a matrix is symmetric, there are other conditions that might suffice, but uh, here our matrix is, is symmetric, so this is enough. If the matrix A is symmetric, then we can find an eigendecomposition into uh, three other matrices, where A is the product of some matrix C, some matrix, some matrix uh, big lambda, and the inverse of C. And uh, what is important here is that the elements of big lambda are only on the diagonal. So there is some vector small lambda, uh, which forms the diagonal entries of, of big lambda. And uh, for our uh, Fibonacci matrix, which is symmetric, we can compute this, or we can have the computer find the result of the eigendecomposition. Uh, this is related to the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the matrix, but um, we won't go there today. So we have here this matrix, and uh, when we have this decomposition, this simplifies the power series of A by quite a bit. And how does that work? So if we here have the kth power of A, and uh, we replace that with the eigendecomposition, and then and we then unroll so to speak, the multiplications. Then we find that uh, we can scratch uh, the C multiplied by its inverse, because it will be the identity that does nothing. So here all these elements, are they, they are removed. And what remains is C times big lambda to the kth power times the inverse of C. And uh, so this expression here. And because big lambda has only elements on the diagonal, we can further simplify the computation. So here we have uh, big lambda and uh, with some entries on the diagonal. And if we want to take the kth power of this matrix, we can just take the individual power of the entries on the diagonal. And you can see that quite easily if you compare with the matrix matrix multiplication. What is going on there? You will see that only the diagonal entries are multiplied with each other. So the rest here is null, doesn't count. And this expression here can be computed really fast because taking the power of a scalar is something that is natively supported or by, by, by the processor architectures. And uh, we can do this in constant time or about constant. So um, in Julia, once again, uh, our code changes a little bit, so only this, this middle part here, these three lines are changed compared to the previous example, where first we have the eigendecomposition, and then we do we compute the element-wise power of the entries of, of lambda. So here this dot, dot, and then, and then some operator, this indicates in Julia that it is an element-wise operation to be performed on, on, on a vector or some other collection. So here uh, we can compute a to the kth power in constant time. And uh, uh, as you see here in the, in the runtime examples, this is not changing even if we go up to very large numbers, provided that everything still fits into the range of the IEEE 754 floating points. Okay, so to recapitulate, where have we started? The first algorithm that we saw, it had exponential runtime. Then we reduced that to linear. Then we reduced that to logarithmic. And now we are down to constant runtime. And uh, what you will see that with a little bit of mathematics, we can get quite substantial improvements in the runtime of, of algorithms. And this will also translate into the optimization algorithms uh, last time we saw gradient descent, and uh, today we will see Newton's method, and there already we will have quite a substantial improvement in the runtime by invoking a little bit more powerful mathematics, but that is still quite 
uh, uh, intuitive and, and uh, not easy to understand, but you will all be able to understand it um, by, by having the, the right perspective and also visual explanation for, for what is going on. If you want to refresh your lineage algebra skills some more, uh, I uh, can refer you to, to these uh, references. So the first is once more the YouTube channel by 3 blue one brown uh, The videos are really well done and uh, give a good visual explanation of uh, what is going on. And uh, the back book by Hubbard and Hubbard, the first chapters will, will give you also a formal background in, in, in the lineage algebra.